All right, we've made it to the big one, my definitive guide to closed rules, no combo. So this is going to be same plus plus wall, though same plus same wall plus wall will also be included. I don't think any instances of same wall will happen, but it works like same with walls. So if you have a 10 facing a wall, you can use the wall to help you set off sames. I don't know if I've said this before, but A's on cards are how they delineate 10s. So if you see an A, that means 10, and it's usually the sign of a very strong card. So we're going to go through my principles, my ideas that I think I think are very useful here. And the first one is, we want to always be secure. So I'm going to ask a lot of questions in this one, and we're not necessarily even going to have cards. The question is going to be, where do you want to go? What is the principled move to make? And our top principle is always be securing. Not always be capturing, always be securing. And a secure card is one that is surrounded by other cards such that it can never be flipped again. And so here, as always, when you see a position, feel free to pause. I'll often say pause and think, where does blue want to go and reply? They have presumably started in one, red has replied in two. Why does that capture? Plus wall. 7 plus 7 equals 14, and 4 plus 10 equals 14. And now it is our move. If we could go anywhere and capture whatever we touch, where would we want to go? And the answer is, of course, we want to go in 4, because we want to secure 1. Going in 5 captures 8, but secures nothing. 8 can also be taken by 3. Uh, sorry, captures 2, but 2 can be also, also be taken by 3. And of course, going in 3 captures 2, but does not secure it, as they could capture back from 5, or capture the card we just played from 6, or protect secure their own card from 4. Whichever way they go, they will have first chance to secure. Well, if we play in 4, we secure immediately. So the first goal is just... Our first priority should be which move secures me cards. So blue is down 7-3. Should they be scared by the score? And where should blue want to move? Again, without even looking at the cards, I do give the cards this time, and we'll come back to the specific cards and talk about which card and where. But first, just coming up with where do I want to go? Where is the move I'd like to make? And do we care about the score? That's a good question to answer, too. But the bigger question is, if I can go anywhere and take all the things I touch, where do I want to go? What's my ideal square to play in? Should have said pause, um, but if you didn't, you can now. But I will now start answering. So the score doesn't really matter very much. If we look, there is no card on the board that is secured. Now, sometimes you won't be able to take, you know, you'd probably, you'd rather capture something than not capture, but securing matters so much more that the specific score is just not a big deal to us. And there are two squares that should jump out as squares we'd like to go in, because there are two squares that secure cards, three and eight. Eight secures the card in nine, but is not secure itself, so that secures one card. Three secures the card in six, and is secure itself. So a move in 3, especially if it can capture 6, is going to secure 2 cards, while a move in 8 is only going to secure 1. And I would also add, if we go in 3, they can go in 8 and secure 1 card. But if we go in 8 and they go in 3, we secured 1, and they were given that opportunity to secure 2 cards. So we definitely want to go in 3 here. It is clearly structurally favorable to go in 3. And being able to identify this, which square we want to go in, is so important and closed. So we didn't care about the score, but we did care about securing the most cards possible. So which squares should we look at first here? Where do we want to go? And again, pause. Again, we're down 7-3, and again, that doesn't really matter. There's nothing secured yet. Okay, so the squares we'd like to go in to secure, we could go in 1, securing 2, and we could go in 6, securing 3 and both those moves secure one card. Now, if we looked a little further, we could think, how many can they secure in reply? If we go in six, they could go in nine and secure one. They could also go in one and secure a card. But we secured a card, and they will have the chance to secure one card in reply. Well, if we go in one, we secure a card. But if they go in four, they secure four, and they could secure one. So they could potentially secure two cards that way. So I think 1 and 6 look like the obvious moves, but if we look a little deeper, if we try to stop our opponent securing, as well as securing ourselves, we see that 6 should be the priority, but 1 is a very possible move as well. 
I would also like to note that 8 is actually um, a reasonable move as well. It doesn't secure anything, but it also doesn't concede any securing moves. Anywhere they go, we can go next to it. Um, I mean, it does secure actually two conceding moves in 1 and 9, but we have such... We secure so many cards and replies in 4 or 6 that that's possible as well. But that's not really the uh, the gist of this, which is what secures cards and concedes the fewest. And 6 is the square we'd ideally like to go in by that standard. All right, here's another one. It is red to move. Where would they like to go? Red trails 6-4 in this example. But again, we don't care so much about the score. We care about securing. So pause and think, where would red like to go? This one's pretty easy. Um, the position's quite bad. Blue has already secured two cards, and we have secured zero. But by playing in five, we can secure the card in six, and that's certainly worth something. So the best move is definitely going to be five, securing the card we can. Uh, here's actually an example from one of the friend games my friend played. And the question is, where do we want to go to secure cards? Because, you know, this is such a key point. And knowing what secures and what doesn't and what, secu ugh, what concedes secure moves is going to let you know where to look first, which are the critical squares to check for moves. And that makes calculation so much easier because you know which moves matter. You're not, oh, I go here and they have eight different moves they might make. Instead, I go here and if they're a good player, they're very likely going to go here in response. And you can start planning for the moves you expect because you start knowing which moves are the ones that are important to play in. So the, the clear move here is 2. 2 secures the card in 1, and it secures itself. I would point out, and again, this is slightly more complicated, 9 is also okay. 9 secures one card, but also you're going to get to play in one of these two squares at the end, and that can potentially secure up to four cards. Um, but the move I really want you to identify here is 2. We definitely do not want to go in 6, for instance. 6 secures nothing. We might be able to capture two things. We're blue here, though it really doesn't matter which color we are. Either one, we're looking for securing moves. Um, but we really wouldn't want to go in 6 here. We could capture both, but we don't secure anything. That would be a poor move. 2 is the move we should identify as, yeah, I want to go in 2. And here's another one. So again, I'm just trying to give as many as ex examples as I can so you can really get this feel for I want to secure. And later, we're going to look back at a lot of these positions and say, which card would we actually want to play? How would we do it? And we'll give explanations for why. But the first principle, the key principle, you know, the first law is always be securing. So which moves can blue play that secure here? Well, any move in this structure is a securing move, right? Because 3 can secure 2, 6 can secure 5, 9 can secure 8. With this specific hand, and no move can secure more than one card. With this specific hand, not all our cards can secure in all squares. Either of our cards can secure in 3, because they have no need to capture. So anything we put in 3 will secure 2. And 6267 can secure in 6 or 9, while 4472 cannot. So we have four securing moves here, and those should be our candidate moves. Second one, do not concede secure cards. I've actually already jumped ahead to this. I forgot I had it separate. But yeah, we've already talked about this position, how three seems a bit better than eight because it secures two, while eight only secures one. But actually, it's even more better than that because eight secures one, but lets them play in three, while three secures two and only gives up them playing in eight. Should we capture their starter? This is a question about conceding securing moves. So you can pause and think about it. And no, we should not, because if we capture in six or eight and they capture from the uh, four or eight and they cap recapture from the other of those squares, they've secured a card. We do not want to give up easy securings. We should play somewhere more distant. We should create the spatial distance. And that's a really important theme that it's one of the things I don't think I cover well enough in this post, but we'll definitely get to it, is creating the spatial distance so as not to concede securings. But denying securings is the principle that gets us to realize, hey, we don't really want to go in 4 or 8. That gives them a really obviously good move in the other of those squares. And as we saw at the very start, 
in this position, we had that position where there was a starter and it was captured. And our first move is very straightforward and good players are going to reliably go in four and second turn will be in trouble. So we really, we do not want to capture their starter. And that's a really important step, I think, in a lot of people's play. All right, so now we have a new thing. How do we choose between cards? So we know we want to secure cards and we want to deny opportunities for them to secure cards. But how can we choose if we have multiple cards or multiple squares that we can secure cards from, how do, and they seem equal on the securing cards and stopping the opponent from securing cards principles, how do we choose which card to play? And I'm going to go through, I believe there are four reasons I'm going to list here, and they're not in a priority order, and some are more important than others, and we'll get to that. But I'm going to talk about four, I think, four ways you might decide between which card to use and which square to play in. And I'm going to pause for a moment, because I want to let a cat out. Sorry about that. So the first way is going to be somewhat favor captures. And I really don't want to emphasize this one because players, especially new players, so overvalue capturing. And it's securing that matters, not capturing. But yes, we slightly prefer to capture cards. But the difference that really matters is going to be whether you secure, not whether you capture. So I'm not going to give any examples of this because, again, I think it's so easy for people to value it too highly, to think it's too important when actually it's a quite small part of playing this rule set well. So very slightly favor moves that capture more cards. So the next one is, and this is such a great principle, use the weakest card that does what's needed. And weakest is going to be in terms of two things. One is some cards are just more powerful than others, but the other is sometimes the directionality of the game means we really need up strength. And our best card by some kind of power level value may have a ton of down strength and left strength, but what we need is up. And so our actual strongest card in this situation might be a more generally weak card that happens to have the values we need in a specific situation. So we've looked at this example before, and we know where we want to go. We want to go in three, and we want to capture six. Now, this might take a little to see, but we actually, two of our cards can go in three and capture six. So when I say pause, I'm going to want you to find both moves in three that capture six and secure six. But I also want you to think, which of those two cards would you play there in terms of keeping the highest power level left in our hand? Pause and think. Okay, so the first part is just a test. Do we remember how same plus and plus wall work? So I think the easier one to see is 6, 6, 3, 3, and 3 has a 3 facing a 7 and a 3 facing another 7. That's going to be a plus. 3 plus 7, of course, equals 3 plus 7. It will flip both. We will tie up the game 5-5. Five, five. We will have a secure card in 3 and a secure card in 6. The trickier one to see, I think, is 6, 1, 4, 7. And we talked about plus wall in terms of gaps. To capture a 7 you're going to need a number that is three higher than the number facing a wall. And you could use either wall. You could use the near wall or the wall far across. And the only card we have with a number three higher facing down than going up or right is 6147, where the four facing down is three higher than the one to the right. So this card in four does not capture, er, in three, does not capture the card in two, but does capture the card in six. So we'd capture one card, we'd be down six, four, and we'd have secured two cards. By the capture more principle, we should be slightly biased towards the 6633 three, and 3, but not that much, because again, it's just a very weak, very slight nudge that only if you're really tied between two options should you uh, d choose the difference by what captures more. Instead, we should be determining by power level. Here, Again, there are two ways to consider power level. We might say the overall strength of the card, but the one I really want to focus on first is directionality of the game. After we go in three, what direction matters the most? It's going to be the direction facing towards cards that can be captured. And the right side of the board is filled, and the left side's empty. That means left power is going to mostly be facing walls. Left power is not worth much. Up and down power is worth a little, and right power is worth by far the most. 
So the most powerful cards we have are going to be the ones with the highest rightward value. 6633 three is our only card with good rightward value. It's our only card that could take two from one or could take the card in five from four. Therefore, this card is our best card, and we want to use the weakest card that achieves our goal. And our goal, we can state very clearly as go in three and capture and secure six. Because our goal is whatever does the most securing. So we know that goal, and if we state that goal clearly, and then deciding which card to play there, we say, okay, I want to use the weakest card that achieves that goal so I can keep my stronger cards for later. This is clearly our strongest card, so we want to play Zagnol 6147 in 3. This is just clearly the correct move. It secures two cards, and it leaves us with the best card in our hand. And so that, I think, is a good example of directionality. We decided which of these cards was better based on the directionality of them. So the next one is going to be Looking at these five cards, we have five different cards. Some are level, uh, they're between levels three and five, uh, four. Um, how would you rank these cards based on how powerful you think they are? We're playing with same plus and plus wall in mind. We're assuming directionality now does not matter. We gave the directionality example. This is one where we're just looking at power level. How would you rank these cards in terms of power level? So pause, think about your ranking. Which cards do you think are best, or card do you think is best? Which cards do you think are weakest? So one way to do it is just say, let's add up all the numbers. What has the highest total power? Well, 6545 five adds up to 20. That would be our best card. 1675 adds up to 19. That would be number 2. 4365 and 7236 both add up to 18, so they would be tied. And 6632 six, adds up to 17 and would be our weakest card. This is a horrendous way to order. Do not do this. Terrible method. Um, what about another way? What if we said, what's the highest peak? You know, we have a 7-6 peak on this card. We have a 7-6 peak on this card. So those two seem the best. Then we have a 6-6 peak on this card. Then 6-5 and 6-5. This is actually a much better ranking. Just using the highest two numbers on each card will give you a significantly, though not perfect, but a significantly better sense than totaling the value of the card. But it's still not a very good ranking. And the key is going to be taking power. And we've talked about how much plus wall affects this before. So if we look at 6545, five, it only has differences of 1 and 2 between the numbers. It's only good at plus walling 9s and 8s. It is totally ineffectual against the kinds of 6s and 7s you'll be facing on levels 3 and 4. This is a very bad card. 4365 might even be better because the 3 and the 6 can take 7s, but it's probably about the same power level. They are both very weak cards. 1675 is better. It has this big peak, and the 1 can help the 5 take other 6s. It should also be noted that because you'll be facing so many 7-6s, having 7-6s yourself can often set up for sames and has some value in itself. But the main thing this card has is the 1 powers up the 5, so the 5 is a little better than a 5 might normally be. For instance, this 5 is more powerful than this 5 or either of these 5s. But the best two cards are the 6632 and the 7236, because in both cases, the 2 and 3 power up the 6 or power up the 6s, because a 4 gap helps the 6 take other 6s with plus wall, and the 3 gap helps the 6 take 7s. So the best card here for pure capturing power is actually the 6632, which from these total values was in fact the weakest card, but is the strongest card at capturing because the two and three power up the sixes so much. Is it the best card? Probably not. Probably the seven, two, three, six is just a tiny, tiny bit better because having a seven gives it this defensive value where it could be played in a lot of situations where it can't be taken, where six is facing out might be. So the six, six, three, two is a little more offensive power, a little more capturing power, while the seven, two, three, six has a bit more defensive value. And I think overall that makes it the slightly better card. But these are clearly the two best cards here. The clear third is 1675, and then these last two cards are very weak. And so when we're deciding if we had all these five cards achieved some purpose, we would want to use either this card or this card, the second or fifth cards, because they are the ones that achieve our goal while using the weakest card available. And on a pure power basis, these are the two cards we want to hold on to 
and maybe this one. So we have these two ways. We really want to we want to figure out our goal, specify and name our goal very explicitly, and then use the weakest card that achieves that goal. And sometimes that card's going to be because of directionality. Here the 6633, the 6 to the right is our most valuable single number. So our 6147 is a weaker card because it has so little right value and we want to use that. Sometimes we want to decide based on power level, and in that case, our second and fifth cards are the ones we want to use first, while our third and fourth are the ones we want to hold on to. Next, we have the rule of even and odds, and this is a rule that helps us look ahead. So I have, my question here is, where do we want to play? Which is our weakest card? How many cards accomplish our immediate goal of, cap of whatever we've stated our goal is, where we want to play is how we state our goal, which is our weakest card, and how many cards could we use that state our goal. And then think about maybe between those, if there are multiple cards that achieve our goal, which one would you use? Okay, so we should know by now we want to go in two and secure three. That seems straightforward. Now if we just look at our hand and look for our weakest card, 1764 has a 76. The 4 powers up the 7 to take other 7s. The 1 actually powers up the 4 to take 7s. Seems pretty good. The 6632s, six, six, we know 2s and 3s play really well with 6s. These are both strong. And the 6554 five, is garbage. So this is definitely our weakest card, and I hope you identified it. Now, how many cards accomplish our goal? Capture 3 from 2 to secure 3. Well, sadly, our weakest card does not do it. The 5 does not capture the 6. We have two ways to do it, and I hope you found both. One is by overpowering. The 7 is higher than the 6, so we can play 1, 7, 6, 4, and 2 and capture the 6. And the other card that does so that's a little harder to see is 2, 6, 3, 6, because 6 plus 6 equals 12, and using the 2 facing the wall, we've seen how the 2s can power up 6s, helps 2, 6, 3, 6 be able to capture a 6. So we have two ways to secure 3. And so the next question is, which is the weakest card of those two? That's the principle we've learned so far. And by that, I think it's really not clear. I don't think it's obvious at all which of these cards are better. They're very different. They're both strong. You might have a preference for one or the other. I think preferring either of these cards is defensible. Um, we might say, for instance, that the game up is going to matter more. Um, because we're playing on the top, and thus the 2 is a little better than the 1, but it's only by a very small margin. Though importantly, a 1 facing up from 9 could not capture while a 2 could. Maybe that biases us slightly towards using keeping the 2636 six, and using the 1764. But I want to add a new principle, the rule of evens and odds. Specifically the rule of evens here, which is that when we play a card, it would be great if they can't take any ways at all. But if they can take, we want a card that we can capture back both ways, right? So that when they take one way, we can capture back the other. We don't want to play a card that is weak one way. They take it, and we can't take it back, and they get an easy, safe, or secure card. So we want to have an even number of vulnerabilities, meaning we want to have an even number of directions we face which we can take back, and, if that, and they can take. And if that's zero, that's great. But in closed, we don't know their cards. They might be able to take things that we can't. We should expect them to be able to pretty regularly take things, especially when we're the first turn player, which we are here. And thus, we should play the move that we can take back both ways. And thus, we want to compare these cards by do they follow the rule of evens? Can we take them back? Because any card in two is going to have two vulnerabilities, one to one and one to five. Which can we play in two that we can take back both ways? Pause, figure it out. I'm now going to continue. One, seven, six, four, and two has a four to the left. That's easy for us to take. We have three numbers higher to the right, and a six down, which we can't overpower, and we can't plus or same either. So it only has one vulnerability, and so if we played one, seven, six, four, and two, and they replied in one, we would not be able to go in five, securing two. And that would be a pretty serious problem, actually. Well, if we play 2, 6, 3, 6, and 2, we can easily take it from below. It only has a 3 facing down, and we can take it 6 to the left two different ways, actually. The 7 overpowers it, and 6, 6, 3, 2s, they can always plus wall. The 2 powers up the 6, so it could capture up the 6 facing left from 2. So the better move here is 2, 6, 3, 6, and 2. 
So our first principle of how to choose between the cards was what is the weakest card. Here, that wasn't obvious, but it also was less important in general than do we follow the rule of evens, right? Do we have an even number of vulnerabilities? And you may say, how does this apply to previous examples? Well, in the example we looked at most, going here, in three, we have zero vulnerabilities, which follows the rule of evens. If you have zero vulnerabilities, you're already secure. That's great. That's the ideal. We want an even number of vulnerable sides. But often, you're not going to be able to get that zero, and so we're going to optimize with two vulnerabilities. I should add, what if we went in eight here, right? It's never going to have zero or two vulnerabilities because it only has one outfacing side. In that case, I would say the kind of principle of odds is if you do are in a situation where you have an odd number of outfacing values, that means specifically when you have one outfacing value, the question is going to be whether your opponent can take it or whether they can't. You will never have an opportunity to take back. So in those situations, you want the highest outfacing values you can have because you just want to make it as hard as possible for them to take it. So our ideal, especially on first turn, is to have zero or two vulnerabilities. On second turn, still would love zero vulnerabilities, but you're often going to have situations where you're going to have one, and you want to make it as hard for them to take as possible. All right, what do we have next? All right, first and second turn have different goals. First turn goes last. That means first turn is going to have the final chance to secure cards, and second turn won't have a chance to reply. Which means if all the numbers are really low, it's going to be easy for first turn to have a final move that captures a lot of things. So first turn wants to follow that rule of evens. First turn wants to have cards vulnerable zero or two ways. Second turn wants to put up as much of a fight as possible, wants to make it as hard to take things as possible. This doesn't mean second turn is just fighting for a tie. If they can do this enough, then they can easily win games. And in fact, on this rule set, I was very, very good at second turn and probably got more wins with it than I did on first. Um, but second turn wants to give first turn difficult things to take. And so the odds is going to be, if an odd number of outfacing values try and make it difficult for the opponent to take, and second turn should really focus a bit more on the odds part, while first turn should focus more on the rule of evens. But they both apply to both players. This is not as strong a goal. The main two principles here are the rule of evens and odds, as applied to any turn, and use the weakest card that accomplishes your goal. And those are the two strongest principles here, and the ones that are going to govern which moves we want to make. All right, then I go into, in this post, an explanation of reasons to uh, choose a starter. And I do want to talk about that now, but I want to keep in mind all the stuff we've said because we're going to get back to it. This is just to give some kind of general ideas. It's less of rules. One idea is a protected strong corner. So in this hand, we see the hand of five cards, and the idea is to play three, six, seven, four, and one. And these two cards, Cactuar and the Ugly Blob, both have a really easy time recapturing it using plus wall. 2636 six, plus wall's the 6, 6263 six, plus wall's the 7. The idea is we play our starter, and if they capture it from one side or the other, we have a really easy time securing it from the other side. Not only that, but if we go in 2 or uh, 4, and they go in 5 taking us, we have an easy time taking those cards back from 3 and 7, as you can see here where the 3, 2, 7, 6, the 2 and the 6 plus wall the 6, and the same thing is happening over here. So this is a very typical protected corner starter hand. You play a corner with high outfacing values, and you have ways to recapture it easily and recapture the recapturers very easily as well. And so it is a hand, if they start trying to take you, you're really well set to respond. Very typical type of hand, protected corner starter is what I call it. Another is a weak corner. Um... This is not an amazing example, but this is a pretty bad hand. This is a tough hand to find a starter. The cards don't fit together well. A lot of them are pretty weak cards, like the 6545. Five. We don't have very good cards. Sometimes it's difficult to find a starter, and in those cases, a really good option is going to be things like a weak corner starter, something that's easy for us to take back. The problem is, it's kind of hard to play one here. We don't have something with a really weak a weak corner value that we can easily take back both ways. So my move here would be 2, 4, 5, 6, and 1, I think. Because the 4 facing right, we can take back three different ways with 5s to the left. 
and the 5 facing down, we can take back three different ways with 6 facing up. And even though 4 and 5 are not the lowest outfacing numbers, this is the easiest corner for us to retake easily. And often in tough situations like this where you've been dealt a bad hand, the choice should be pick a weak starter. And why do weak starters, why do weak corners make sense? Because they follow the rule of evens, right? This is the most rule of even type starter. The idea is we make both sides so vulnerable, they're easy for us to take back, and we want two vulnerabilities. Um, so those are two useful starter types. Another is a kind of offbeat one. So this is an aggressive side starter, and the idea is to play 5, 7, 3, 1 in 4. The point is, the 7 facing towards the middle can't be taken. There's no wall facing the middle, so it can't set up a plus wall, so the seven's just as strong as it could be. And any card they try to put next to it in one or seven, we can capture from two or eight, specifically using the four, 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 seven, where the four is facing up and down, power the seven up. So the seven could already over, uh, overpower anything six or lower, but now it can also plus wall any sevens. So the idea is to put something in a side and make sure you can capture anything they can put next to that side in the adjacent corners. This is a much less common type of starter, but I like trying to identify more types so people have more options in their mind and ideas of things they could try building around. And you can see here the starter and how good Chocobo, the bird, is at taking cards in one or seven. Um, another idea is a center drop. So this is a classic example from a player named Homer, where Remember, A's are tens, so we have four cards that are incredibly strong. We have two A9s, we have two AAs, and we have one card that is garbage. And the center drop is the idea, I just throw my weakest card in the middle. The middle square can set up synergies, but is generally going to be kind of less impactful, less committal, because it's so easy to take back later, while a corner, you're going to really have to be ready to take it back at a moment's notice. The center, you're in no rush, and it's just very easy to take at the end, and if you're on first turn, it's really nice to have easy cards to take at the end, because those are necessarily secure. So the idea of this hand is to drop one three three five bite bug in the middle of the board in five, and then have really strong cards to play around it. Then there are other types of five drop hands. So this one, it might seem obvious to you. Aha! 6266 is the weakest card. You're planning to drop that in five. And they are, but this time, they're not just throwing it there because it's weak. They're throwing it there because it sets up synergies. And this is a really cool board. You can pause and look at it for a moment and see the kind of synergies it sets up. But if Barrett, the man here, goes in 1, 3, 7, or 9, it sets up all kinds of pluses and sames. So for instance, Barrett is in 1. Now Kyros has a plus in 2. 10 plus 2 equals 6 plus 6. Barrett's in 3, Kyros is the same. 6 and 6 are the same as are 7 and 7. And you can see that there are sames with Quistus, the card in 4 and 6, and there are sames and pluses all over the place. This is a hand designed to set up synergy with itself. Once that middle card is in 5, Barrett can go in any of the corners and set up sames and pluses and thus easy recaptures for all your other cards. And so one reason to play in five is this is a bad card and I just want to get rid of it and move on with the game, or this is a weak card and I want to be able to have easy recaptures. But another is, here's a card that synergizes really nicely with the rest of my hand and can set stuff up. So those are classic starter types. Then I have a section on replying to starters. I'm going to skip that for now because I think it uh, gets into some stuff that I'm not... I'd like to get back to my main themes. So here is an example. We've looked at this multiple times before, but we now have tools, right? Our tools are, we know always secure and don't allow securings. And that told us which is the square we want to play in here. Do you remember? We wanted to play in six because it captures and secures three. One is not as good because while it does capture and secure two, they could then go in four, capturing and securing both one and four. So our ideal is six. Now we have two choices of cards that go in six and capture three. That's our goal. Which card do we want to play? I've given you four tools, but the two most useful tools are what is our weakest card and following the rules of evens and odds. And those are going to be the two most powerful tools you have. And which of the two cards that can capture from six do you want to play there? Okay, so... Our two cards that do so are our two cards with sixes facing up. 
Um, 6147 also captures the card in 5, but that's not very important. We know that. That's not one of our main principles here. The rules of evens and odds suggested it has one outfacing value, so we'd like that number to be as high as possible. 6147 has a 4 facing down. That's a little higher than a 3 facing down, but there are so many numbers above both 3 and 4, it's not that big a difference. But both of those, capturing and uh, capturing should slightly bias us towards 6147. Having a higher outfacing value should slightly bias us to 6147. But the big question is, what's our weakest card? You know, we want to use the weakest card that accomplishes our goal. And in this case, once we play in 6, the game over here will sort of have a downright directionality to it, and the game over here will have an up left. Now our only card that has any power right is still 6633, like the previous example. This card is somewhat redundant to 4357. They do have different powers, but it is closer to being redundant to powers we already have. So we really want to keep the 6633. If you were really clever here, you notice the 6633 actually is a double capture in this square in 4, because 6 plus 2 equals 3 plus 5, 8, and so it has some squares that are already just really powerful for it, with the plus in, in uh, 4. So we want to use the weakest card that accomplishes our goals. Now 6147 was better for lots of reasons. You know, it captured an extra card, it had a slightly higher number facing down, but those were very weak reasons. Our strongest reason is we really want to hold on to 6633, we don't mind expending 6147. And that's the reason we play it in 6. And if you preferred it for one of the other reasons, I think you're overvaluing those reasons a little bit, or you thought that the difference between a 4 and a 3 was more meaningful than it was. But the big reason that we want to use 6147 is because we want to hold on to our best cards. And here, that's the 6633. And here I go through the four things I set up. And here's another position. We already looked at it. We know there are four moves that secure something. And now we have these other principles. How do we choose between the four securing moves? So I want you to pause and think about your preference between the four securing moves. All right. So we know the four securing moves are 4, 4, 7, 2, and 3, and 6, 2, 6, 7 in any of the squares. And that should already be a huge hint to us, because we immediately should know what's the weakest card. You know, 6, 2, 6, 7 is great in every square. 4, 4, 7, 2 is great in only one square. So it should become instantly apparent, I want to use the weakest card. And 4, 4, 7, 2 is the weakest card. And it fits odds and evens really well. It is one outfacing value, and that outfacing value is the maximum number, a 7. So this is just a very clearly desirable move. And I think it isn't to a lot of starting players who are biased towards capturing first. But if we move away from capturing and start thinking about using the weakest card, the move that should jump out is 4, 4, 7, 2, and 3. Um, 6, 2, 6, 7, and 9 is also a pretty good move. 6 outfacing is good, and because they will likely reply in 6, having a 7 facing down with this card, Deathclaw, is very good in 3. And so if you pick that move, that's also a pretty good move. I think it's a little less um, thematic, a little less kind of structurally thoughtful, but it's also a very good move. I can't complain too much. Now, let's do a little calculation, because calculation is important. If we play 4, 4, 7, 2, and 1, and they go in four, uh, in 3, and they go in 6 or 9 and do not capture anything, we know Elastoid 6267 will capture something with its 7 facing left. The curse score is currently 5-5, five, five, so we will win at least 6-4. So the only way they have any chance not to lose is if they can play in 6 and capture 4-4-7-2-3. Four, four, and three. And then they will go up 6-4. Now we know we can't lose, because our 7 will capture this card, so it's going to be at least 5-5. Five, five. And the question is, will our 6-up capture their card? Now, if they have a 5 or less, of course we capture. If they have a 6 down, we plus wall, because 6 plus 6, or 6 up, meets their 6 down. So that's 12, and we have a 2 facing the wall. 2s power up 6s, as we know. So we can plus wall any 6, and the only thing we can't take is a 7. So the only way we don't win is if they can capture our 7 facing down and have a 7 facing down of their own. So we're going to win that an enormous percentage of the time. I, I wouldn't know like how to estimate it, but like if you said 90% plus, that seems plausible. Um, it's going to be a huge number. What about the other move? 6, 2, 6, 7, in 9. Here, any move they make in 6, we actually do win. They can capture a card, 
but our 7 facing down will capture anything, because it already captures anything 6 or less, and the 4s help it plus wall 7s, 4s power up 7s, and so we go in 9, go up 6-4, they go in 6, we capture, uh, tie at 5-5, five, five, and we capture from 3 and win 6-4, and we will win against any move. However, the downside is, if we go in 9 and lead 6-4, and they go in 3, capturing the card in 2, making it 5-5, five, five, our 4 up and our 2 to the left are pretty unlikely to be able to capture. So they will usually tie if they go in 3, while they will always lose if they go in 6. Now they're likely to go in 6. 6 secures more cards, 6 is the natural move. So this move will win a very high percentage of the time as well, but I think it's going to be somewhat lower than uh, 4, 4, 7, 2, and 3 is our first move. But both are very good moves. If you picked either, you should feel glad. I feel 4, 4, 7, 2 is the more thematic move. It fits the kind of principle of let's use our weakest card first. But of course, 6, 2, 6, 7, and 9 is both has a strong outfacing value, secures a card, and 4, 4, 7, 2 is better because it's going to be facing down towards where they're likely to play. So it's certainly not a bad move either. They're both very good. Do I have any more examples here? I do have another example. Um, ah, yes, this is an interesting one. So it's blue to move. The score is 5-5. Five, five. So again, we want to figure out what do we want to achieve and which is our weakest card that achieves that goal or which fulfills the rules of evens and odds. Those are, again, our two main principles. So pause and think about what and where you would play. All right, we have three squares we can play in the secure card. We could play in 6, securing 3, we could play in 8, securing 7, or we could play in 5, securing 2 and 4. So I hope you identified we want to go in 5, securing 2 and 4, which means we need to be able to take 2. However, all three of our cards do so. So the next question is, which card to use? And that's pretty tricky. And I think you could argue this a few different ways. I think... So we'll break it down by our two main principles, the weakest card that does so. And one might think, okay, if we play in five, the directional directionality that matters most is going to be up to the left, facing the cards already played. And that's true. But this gets into directionality can get more complicated. Sometimes, if we play in five, they're likely to go in six or eight, and we're probably then going to take the other one. And we're on second turn. This is important. Five cards have been played, we're on second turn. That means we really want to make as difficult stuff for them to capture as possible. After we go in five, and they go in six or eight, we'll want to go in the other one with as high a value facing towards nine as possible for their last turn. So we actually do want to have down and right value. So this whole what's the weakest card here is a very tricky question, like much trickier than it seems so far. This is, I think, a a cool example because it starts showing how the game can get more complex and where the game can start going as you get deeper into it. So it's really not obvious because it looks like up left should matter, but we're second turn and that means actually down and right matter a lot as well. So it's not obvious which is the weakest card. So I think a better thing to start with here is the rule of evens and odds. And we're going to go in five. All our cards are good in five. They all capture and secure. Which one to use? Well, we want one we can take back two ways. Now, each of these cards, we can take back at least one, but we can start eliminating things. For instance, 4, 4, 7, 4 in 5. We cannot take it back from 8. They're likely to go in 6, and we don't have the recapture. So 4, 4, 7, 5, 7 4 in 5, I think is a mistake. We've ruled out a card. Good. We've made progress because it only has one vulnerability to us. We can only take it back one way, and that's the way they're likely to take it from. So I do not like 4474 4, 4 in 5. And then the question is, the other two cards. Now both we can take back both ways. 6316, the threes we can take back with 4474, 4, 4, and the one we can take back with either card. 7513, the one we can take back with either card, and the five to the right we could take back with a six to the left. But the big question, now we start combining our two principles. We want something weak both ways, so we know we want to use one of the top two cards, and we want something that sets up our best cards for later, right? And what we want, what we're going to want, this is takes calculation, is to play something in five, and then when they go in six or eight, we play in the other one with the highest value facing towards nine. So let's look at both moves and what they set up. 
7, 5, 1, 3. If we play it in 5 and they go in 6, we could play 4, 4, 7, 4, and 8, and we get a 4 facing towards 9. If we go 7, 5, 1, 3 in 5 and they go in 8, we can only take back with 6, 3, 1, 6, and we'll have a 1 facing down. So we can have a 4 or a 1 facing 9 if we start with 7, 5, 1, 3. What about 6, 3, 1, 6? Well, if they go in 6, we can take back from 8 with 7, 5, 1, 3, and a 5 facing towards 9, already better. And if we start with 6, 3, 1, 6, and 5, and they take from 8, we can take back from 6 with 4, 4, 7, 4, and a maximal 7 facing down towards 9. So if we think about this, if we calculate, if we combine all the principles we've had, but also include this kind of looking further, we see 6, 3, 1, 6, and 5, the card with the weakest outfacing values, sets us up to have higher outfacing values later. And that's really important, and I think that's a tricky one that sort of helps you uh, dive further into the complexity this game has to offer. So um, now I'm going to return to how to reply to starters. Um, I'm going to run over this quickly because I think it's um, useful. I'm specifically going to talk about corner starters because that dominates most levels of play. And I just want to kind of quickly run this over. I think it's a useful guide, but I don't want to focus on it too much. I think I'm running long, and I think it's less important than the principles said so far. But when someone starts with a corner, why might we go in different squares? So here's, they've started with a corner starter. Now, can we take their corner starter? We look at our hand. We have nothing higher than a 6 to the left. There's obviously nothing higher than a 7 up. Then you look, can I plus wall it? We have no ways to plus wall it, so we cannot take their starter. And a great reason to go in 5 is because it is the only square that impacts both squares next to their starter. So we can set up sames and pluses in both squares. And so you can see a move like 4, 5, 6, 4 in 5. The 4 up helps set up um, some sames. This card has a 4 down and a 6 left, so that's going to be a same if we put this in 5. This card also has a 4 down and a 6 to the left. So by playing 4, 5, 6, 4, and 5, we set up moves in 2. And do we set up moves in 4 as well? Yes, we do. 3, 6, 3, 6, right? We have a 4 to the left and there's a 7 down. So we need a gap of 3. 3 higher to the right than up. And 3, 6, 3, 6 fulfills that goal. Now, I want you to pause for a sec and figure out what's another card I could play in 5 that sets up sames and pluses in both 2 and 4, because we can't take either way, so we want to make sure we can take both ways and set that up. So pause and think about how you would set up double captures from both 2 and 4 with a different card than playing 4, 5, 6, 4, and 5. Okay, there are multiple ways to do it, not just one. Um, four, 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 seven, and five. Four, four, seven, four, and five works because it is a four up and a four to the left, and so it's going to set up the exact same sames and pluses as before. A slightly different one that I hope you found is four, 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 six, and five. It sets up with the four up. It sets up the same same and two, but also it sets up a plus and five for four, five, six, four because four plus seven equals five plus six. This is not coming immediately to you. Pause. Think about the squares. Think about where you'd play after. So the, uh, one reason to go in five, and a big reason, is I want to set up against their starter. I have difficulty taking it, and five is a square that lets me take it. That's a good reason to go in five. Um, so reasons to play in five. It was the only way we could set ourselves up to be able to capture both ways. It sets up one of our cards specifically. Maybe we had a card that could take one way but not the other, but by playing in five, we set up that card to be able to take both ways. That's great. It means we only have to hold on to one card and we can use all our others. If we have to hold on to two cards because they both can take one way, then that gives us a lot less options of what we can do because we're so needy to hold on to multiple cards in our hands. Another reason is we've seen that five drops can help set up synergies. So if a card we put in 5 synergizes with the rest of our hand, that can be a great reason to go in 5. And the standard form of going in 5 is that they play a corner we can't take, but 5 sets us up both ways. Now, we could also play in 2 or 4. We could capture them immediately. And we really should not do this. You can see I wrote here, don't do this one unless you have incredibly good reason to believe they can't recapture. Seriously, it's bad. It gives them a free securing move. Seriously, though, the standard form of this move is not to play it. I really hope talking about securing so much means the capturing reply, you already have this good intuition that it is a mistake. What about adjacent corners? 
Now, this one's complicated, but we can look at this starting position. Let's say we could take one way, but not the other, right? Let's say we could take from four, but not from two. Then we might go in three to set up a capture in two. And this can be a really good trap, because if we go in three and they block the move in two, we now take from four, which we said we could do, and are the first to secure a card. So adjacent corners are a nice way to kind of trap them into stuff. I give a lot of explanation here. You can pause if you want to read. I will now scroll down slightly. Um, but adjacent corners are a really important way to meet a corner starter. You should definitely keep this one in mind. Um, reasons to play in the far corner. Well, if we can already take their corner both ways and now can set up a corner that's difficult for them to take, that can be a great option. A strong corner, of course, can be very tough for them to take. Um, it can also be the case that they played a strong card in one corner and that used up a lot of their value in the opposite direction, right? In this example, the 3674 uses up a ton of town right power. So maybe by playing in the bottom right, you direct the game in a way where they've already used up much of their power. And that can be a really powerful tool. Um, there are a couple other reasons given here, but I think that's the main one. Uh, you can also play on the far side. This is another way where you usually want to do it if you could already take their corner both ways and want to keep the spatial distance. You obviously don't want to capture it, and you also don't want to play in five because you think it might set their cards up more than it sets up your own. Um, it's sort of this kind of waiting move. I, don't, I haven't found a good way to describe it. It's a rare move, but I don't think a bad one at all. Um, and I think if you can take their card both ways, playing in a far side in six or eight if they've gone in one, can be a useful tool. Also, if you can't take it anyways, and you can't set up any ways to take it, it can be useful to play far away and direct the game in some other direction, and playing in six or eight, or playing in the far corner in nine, can be a way to do so. Um, and then I gave a flowchart that I think might be useful. Where, which kind of gives you a, it's not optimal, but I think it's pretty good, which gives you a kind of path to follow. So you look at their corner. If you can take it both ways, then you can go anywhere, except you can't capture it, because we know that's bad. Um, probably give your opponent the greatest challenge by going in the um, adjacent or far corner with solid outfacing numbers that you can recapture. Do not use up a card that you need to be able to capture their corner. But if you can take their corner both ways, Everything is allowable. You can play whichever type of move you want, except don't capture it. What if you can only take it one way? Uh, then you want to go in the adjacent corner that sets you up to be able to take it the other way as well. If you don't have such an adjacent corner, see if there's a move in five that sets you up to be able to take it the other way as well. Um, ideally, such that you have one card that can take it from both ways. We've talked about that. If that doesn't exist, then play the first adjacent corner move anyway, even though it doesn't set up a way to same or plus in the uh, side square in between, because often your opponent will block that side square anyway in fear, and then you will have the first chance to secure a card. You know, if we look at this example, if they go in one and we go in three and they block two, we could secure a card in any of four, five, or six and be first to do so. So if we can't set up a way to take the way that we couldn't take at the start, um, a good thing to do is play that adjacent corner anyway. Now what if you can take it zero ways? First, look at five, if you can set up a capture from both sides, as in the example above. Remember, we couldn't actually take their starter from either directions, but by playing in five, we could set up captures in both, and that was really strong. So if we can't take it anyway, a good thing to look for is look for a move in five. If there's not a move in five, then do something distant and try to direct the game away from their starter. And if you're a poker player, you might think, I need to balance my range, right? If I only play distantly when there's, they play a starter that I can't take either way, they're going to figure that out and try to exploit me and start playing next to their starter, knowing I won't be able to capture it from the other side. But what I did with this flowchart is I gave a few options in each situation, and because all options are permissible if you could take their starter both ways, that means sometimes you're going to be playing distant moves anyway, and so it won't give away that information because you'll be playing these types, each type of move in multiple situations. So it won't make it obvious to your opponent what options you actually have. And so I think that's a good overview of ways to meet corner starters. Corner starters are by far the most common, and so it's useful to think about different ways to meet them and figure out your preference. But the main thing this was about was the key to 
defini my definitive guide to uh, closed rules no combo says the main the first thing we want to do is always be securing and don't allow their moves to secure and then the second thing when we're deciding between moves is we have these four principles one is somewhat favor captures another is think a little about whether your first or second turn but the two big ones are use the weakest card that accomplishes your goal your goal being what secures the most and allows your opponent to secure the least and what follows the rules of evens and odds right if you have one if you have zero sides facing out that's great you're already secure if you have one side facing out you want it to be as high a number as possible so it's hard for your opponent to take and if you have two sides facing out you're going to want both of them to be sides you can recapture and we saw that with starters right the corner starters are starters that the hand is built to be able to take back both ways the weak corner starters are playing a card so weak it's very easy to take it back both ways right? So the big one, the big takeaway is figure out the securings. That tells you what you want to achieve. And then when deciding which card to use, use the weakest card that accomplishes your goal that most fulfills the rules of odds and evens. And I think that I'll call that a video. I This was a long one, but I really wanted to cover the, uh, the depths of the rule set because I think it has a lot to show. And I hope you could see some of the complexity and interest of it. Cheers.